doesn't seem possible, but over 50 years ago, I was the announcer on the original radio program called The Shadow. They'd had this radio program called Detective Story Hour, which was a story out of Detective Story. And just as a gimmick, they used as they called the announcer The Shadow. I worked with three shadows, Orson Welles and uh, uh, Johnston and uh, Brett Morrison. You know, sometimes the scripts were so complicated that when I finished, I wasn't really sure, you know, what had happened, actually, not always, but occasionally they they brought me. And then I found out what the heck he was laughing at. He was unseen, invisible, the perfect embodiment of the radio and pulp hero, a creation that could only have succeeded in the media of the imagination. He was the shadow. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> For nearly six decades now, that disembodied voice, with its mocking, sinister, haunting laugh, has stirred the imaginations of millions of radio listeners from Maine to California. The shadow endures today as the dominant symbol of mystery drama during radio's golden age in the 30s, 40s, and early 1950s. Two years ago, I was in the hospital for an operation. And the resident doctor, young resident, came running up to my room to meet me because he, he knew that I had been associated with the shadow, which everybody knows. I mean, they may not have heard anything else about, about radio, but everybody knows the shadow. It could never have succeeded in television. It, it, it was the marvelous thing of what, what people conjured up in their minds. I mean, they could see the shadow, and they could see Margot and so forth. I think it would have been a terribly dull television program. What creative forces molded the shadow's tremendous popularity? Why, after nearly 60 years, is the program not only remembered fondly, but still being aired on many radio stations across the nation? Who were the people that shaped the character's success? We'll take an in-depth look behind the scenes of one of radio's most popular programs. We'll talk with the people who helped make it all happen. And we'll illustrate their comments with excerpts from the programs they helped create. The Shadow's origins date back to 1929. McFadden Publishing had begun utilizing an emerging medium, radio, to boost the sales of their true detective magazine. Now their publishing competitors, Street and Smith, took a hard look at the new medium with a view toward stemming the McFadden tide that seemed to be sweeping away the readership of their own detective story magazine. McFadden's success was particularly galling to Street and Smith, After all, it was Street and Smith that had first developed the popular detective magazine format when they transformed the old Nick Carter magazine into Detective Story. Detective Story had spawned a host of imitators, and it was now one of these, True Detective, that was challenging Street and Smith's preeminence in the field. Street and Smith's advertising agency, Rethroff and Ryan, conceived the idea of a weekly radio mystery anthology dramatizing material drawn from the current issue of Detective Story magazine. The scriptwriter who was to adapt the magazine material to a radio format, a young man named Harry Charlot, suggested that the host announcer for the new series be a mysterious-sounding character who would speak through a filter microphone. He was to be called The Shadow. <laughs> the shadow knows. <laughs> Street and Smith's Detective Story Magazine Hour made its debut over CBS on July 31st, 1930, with The Shadow as host. 
But, as sometimes happens, the shadow gimmick quickly became a case of a tail wagging the dog. Stories from the magazine, even the name of the magazine, were quickly forgotten. But the shadow, as narrator, became a veritable media sensation. As one reviewer of the day put it, the shadow announcing the Street and Smith detective stories waxes more melodramatic than the characters themselves in the skit presented. And a few months later, while the true detective stories beat Street and Smith to the air with the dramatization of its mag stories, the latter firm does its best to make its program creepy, starting at the announcements by the shadow, who delivers in low register hissing and growling in villainous fashion. Announcer Ken Roberts was involved with the shadow almost from the beginning. I had come to CBS as a very, very young man in early 1931. And uh, I announced many different kinds of programs, of course. But one day, fortune smiled upon me, and I was asked to come on to a program which had, was fairly new at that time and had been on the air, I believe, a year or maybe less, a program called The Shadow. I was not the first announcer, but I did come on to the program in 1931, at which time the uh, shadow was nothing like what it was in later years when it featured Lamont Cranston. When I came on to the show, the shadow was a series of dramatic crime programs solved by different detectives every week. The role of the shadow on that program was to introduce it and to act as something of a narrator. And once he had done his opening line, he was practically finished on the program until the very end of the show when he came back with the weed of crime bears bitter fruit, crime does not pay, the shadow knows. What went on in between his two appearances on the program, of course, was a, as I said before, a crime program or a pro detective story, things of that sort. And uh, the man who read the lines that I referred to before, concluding with the shadow nose, was a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Lakerta. Shadow historian Anthony Tolan. Lakerta was very much in the Valentino mold. He was a Broadway actor, Latin lover type. Dorothy Randall Reddick, the estranged wife of Frank Reddick, commented that if you walk down the street with Jimmy, women's heads turned when he walked by. He had that kind of charisma. Unfortunately, or actually fortunately for the character, Lakurdo's ambitions were aimed at Broadway. Jimmy left for uh, another job of some sort or perhaps another assignment. In any case, he did leave the show and he was replaced by a gentleman who played the part for three to five years after that, Frank Reddick. And Frank, of course, was one of the best actors in radio. He had appeared on almost all the shows that were on the air at that time. And uh, he took on the assignment. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> this was years before Raymond would host Inner Sanctum. It was before The Man in Black on Suspense, or The Mysterious Traveler, or The Whistler. And all of those, I'm sure, were patterned after The Shadow, after Frank Reddick. And I think you have to realize also, I mean, the radio station, CBS especially, had discovered the advantages of having mysterious on the air personages. The silver masked tenor of the air was very popular until he unmasked himself and his career was never the same after that. The same year, I think, 1930, uh, Arthur Tracy began as a street singer and for a long time there was a secrecy about who the street singer was. It was a build-up. And it was natural to do this on a show like Detective Story Magazine. It just had not been done before, and audiences had heard these announcers with these wonderful smooth voices and singers on the air, but they had never heard a voice coming over the air, like Frank Reddick as The Shadow. One reader wrote into De Detective Story magazine and told about how his dog started howling whenever The Shadow spoke on the air. I mean, this was 
a voice that over those early radio sets, remember, I mean, the staticky sounds of that, but this harsh voice came over. People listened. People listened indeed. But when they went rushing to their neighborhood newsstands, it was the shadow magazine that they clamored for, not detective story. Street and Smith had a potential hit on their hands, but no product to sell. The shadow magazine did not yet exist. Yeah, I was a, an editor up at McFadden's. I edited True Strange Stories. That was that was how I was getting into the magazine business. And um, that was why Blackwell wanted me to write The Shadow, because he knew that I'd edited a weird magazine with True Strange Stories, and that I was also a newspaper writer and could write fast, and he said, go ahead and write something in this vein. Street and Smith hired Walter Gibson, a former magician and newspaper writer, to develop the shadow character into a saleable product. We spoke with Gibson recently on the occasion of his 87th birthday. After the shadow began to go, uh, all the other competition magazines simply said, oh, write something, let's get up a name, something like the shadow, let's get in there all doing that. And just as they had thrilling love story, popular love story, the dime love story, everything of that sort. They, they all copied the different things, and and uh, that was the going of it. So that spring all followed in. So you naturally expected them to, to write the same type of stuff. The Phantom was the first, then came the Spider, then came things like Operator 5, Secret Agent X, Dr. Wu Fan. <laughs> the last one of the lot was the Green Lama. In order to establish their ownership of the shadow character as something more than merely the host of a radio mystery program, in April 1931, Street and Smith published the first issue of The Shadow magazine. No longer was The Shadow just a disembodied voice. He was now a sinister crusader against crime with adventures all his own. Gibson had created a whole cast of magazine characters, agents who would help the Shadow in his fight against evil. Initial plans were to publish the Shadow magazine quarterly, but when the first issue sold out, and the second issue, after a double press run, sold out too, Street and Smith changed their plans. By its third issue, the Shadow magazine became a monthly, and eleven months after that, it went to twice a month. In the summer of 1931, the first of six two-reel shadow motion picture shorts was released to theaters. I would knock off 30 to 40 pages I could a day. The pages were 250 words, and there were 200 pages to, uh, uh, to a story. That meant in five days, if I did 40 pages a day, I'd had my writing done. If I did only 30, that meant six, really seven days and I frequently would do that. Our idea was to make something that sold. And uh, we we liked this particular thing. Blackwell laid it out well, very well to me. He said, we, you're given these things in the magazine and find out what they like. And he said, you, they like meat and they like potatoes and they like a couple of other things and you start giving them these. Well, pretty soon you say, hey, these people, we better give them a bit more of a variety. Let's give them some carrots and some spinach and you come up with these wonderful things. And he said, what do you find out? You find out that they like potatoes. For God's sake, give them potatoes. That's <laughs> now, the old school stayed with that, but what, what my contribution to it, to which, which Nanovic was responsible to a marked degree because he went along with me and therefore would even come up with suggestions, ours was to draw away from that and uh, not just make them a stereotype, but we did realize that a lot of the readers were stereotyped. And the readers were expecting a certain similarity. So I kept things like the shadow sanctum, but I built, I built in these things and began adding to them. So these new things, and they liked it. And they, I don't think they'd ever done anything like that before. Walter Gibson, under the pen name of Maxwell Grant, wrote 282 shadow novels in addition to his 117 books on magic, games, and other subjects. Gibson got inspiration for many of his plots from his travels. One of these, Grove of Doom, 
was inspired by a casual remark by Street and Smith's general manager, Bill Ralston. Ralston complained to Gibson about consistently losing his golf balls in a grove of trees adjacent to the golf course he frequented. Ralston told about how they'd been playing golf and the golf balls would go in this woods. And they'd go in there and look for them. And when you got under these copper beaches, you would see this weird light because of the result. Well, I was familiar with the same thing because I'd gone camping up in Canada. And when you go carrying those loads on a portage, um, every now and then you'd hit a, a chunk of maple wood. And suddenly out of the green woods and you were just maple woods and you got that same strange or, or, or different lighting effect. So this grove, I used that, we called it the Grove of Doom. So I had two families that were having arguments about each other and they lived on different hillsides and in between was the valley and there was this grove. So somebody got the idea of knocking somebody off when he got in that grove. So murders began to, began to happen in the grove. And um, Chinese became involved in the story and things of that sort. Well, these people were found dead one after another in the grove. Well, it turned out that Kun Woon was a, a python from the snake temple in Penang and he had been brought over and put in that grove just to take human victims as they came through and he was the murderer and well that of course the scene led to Chinatown when they were trying to find a local murderer and things of that sort. The Black Hush predicted the uh, blackout of many years later um, and what the Black Hush was these crooks had devised a flashlight or searchlight, a huge searchlight, but it, it shot blackness instead of light. So all they would do would be set this on top of a building and take a bank or something across the way and hit that with a smack. Every all the electricity would go out in the bank and would come the crooks and do the stuff. Well, every time the shadow would go and try to get him, they'd nail him. And one thing that they were very strong in, they had a place out in the country. All you had to do was fly over it with a plane. And bang, they just turned on the black hush for the black light, and they killed all the electric work in the plane, and you were done. So to attack them by plane was the worst thing you could do. You were stuck. Well, the shadow flew over in his auto gyro. Well, now you know the auto gyro is the way they worked. The, uh, that big window on top was not a motor. It was, a fa it was like a wing. And all you did was cut off your motor, and that, the faster you came down, the faster it went, and the more it stopped you like a parachute. So the shadow simply f flew around until he knew he'd got the place because all of a sudden, bang, and all his electricity is cut out. And he says, this is what I wanted. And he lands right on their damn place because he just coasted down into it. And he didn't need any power. And that was when he came and finished them. Well, I had stories like that. And those were, we played those very strongly. In Florida, there's a lake called Orange Lake. And Orange Lake is about 10 miles long. And it runs from one county to another. And it has floating islands. Now the reason these islands float is the lake is fairly shallow. And it has at the bottom a lot of um, uh, water lilies that keep coming up. And every now and then they get so strong that they come up and bring up a mass of, of mud with them. Well, birds drop seeds on the muds and other things grow and gradually islands begin these floating islands and they're bigger than this room and solid and trees grow on them and I would checked that through a guidebook but I had a good scene that they're after this guy and he keeps stalling off the sheriff and uh, he has this remote shack on this lake that nobody's paying any attention to and but he goes there and the sheriff comes there the next morning to nail him and there ain't no there ain't no shack because the shack has sailed 10 miles down the lake is now another county so i put all these things in the the one i think you'd get the most kick out of was where i had a an institution one one university had it where they st were studying apes and uh, gorillas and things and kept them there and they had some pretty tough keepers at the place, so I got the idea of the keepers being um, guys that had been in jail. When they get out of jail, the other people would get them. And then, you know this story? They would go on robbing, robbing, and uh, I had two wonderful things. Uh, 
They'd be driving around with a truckload of gorillas or, or various types of monkeys. And uh, if they went to, if they were going west, they were taking them to Sarasota for the circus. If they're going east, then they're taking them to the jungle gardens at Miami. So they had perfect alibis. I knew all this stuff from living down there. My father-in-law at the time owned a, a, a Norwich Grove. And other, I'd get over to New Orleans and uh, get things over there and uh, come in with all this stuff. Well, these people didn't really, uh, they don't seem to realize that. They'd think I was spending my time down in the village or doing some other crazy thing. We asked Gibson whether the shadow plots were ever intentionally topical. Tremendously topical. Extremely so. And uh, earlier, that was one of the troubles of the war. We couldn't make him topical then. I had to stop the topical stuff because the things were going on in real life and uh, on a much bigger scale. And in earlier, I had him tied in with things like the League of Nations and things of that sort. And not only that, but we were cut down. This is a thing the jerks can't get through their heads. The reason that I went to Whodunit Stories was our magazine had taken on the format of a whodunit. So I began going into the, into the whodunit stories during the war. And one guy, well, oh, Gibson was getting tired. In other words, he thought these stories sounded tired. Well, I think he was getting tired of reading anything except what he wanted to read. I mean, it was one of those things that was silly. I was simply going by what Nanavik and others thought were the, the trends. Meanwhile, back at the offices of Street and Smith, the editors of the company's other publications were complaining. Virtually the entire corporate advertising budget was being spent to promote the Shadow magazine, and they were beginning to feel like stepchildren. Manager Ralston capitulated, with a strange result. They were shifting to Love Story magazine, and they kept the Shadow as an announcer on Love Story. I don't know whether anybody's kept those scripts, but for 40 weeks there were 40 weeks of love, and the Shadow was the announcer because Ralston, as the good business manager, says, well, we identify the Shadow with Street and Smith, and Love Story is also published by Street and Smith, so keep the announcer, don't get rid of him. And so, incongruous as it may have sounded, the Shadow became host of Love Story dramas. One reviewer bemoaned the Shadow's being transplanted to the Love Story Hour, what a loss to fandom when the shadow tottered from his underworld throne to those Street and Smith love stories, he wrote. Concurrent with his love story activities, the shadow served a brief stint as mystery host on CBS, and later in 1932 moved to NBC for his own program, finally called The Shadow. It later returned to CBS. The relationship with Blue Coal, a company that first sponsored the program regionally in 1931, continued. It would endure for almost two decades. Announcer Ken Roberts. The program was very successful and remained in that format for, oh, till I think it was 1935 or so, during which time it grew from being a half-hour program to a full-hour program, which was called the Blue Coal Radio Review. The Blue Coal Radio Review was so called because our sponsor was Blue Coal. The uh, director, the producer of the program, was a marvelous man whom all the actors in radio dearly loved, Bill Sweets. Bill was his name. In addition to producing the program, of course, he also directed the actual shadow sequence itself. The conductor of the orchestra was George Earl, and we would have a half hour of music and then a half hour of the shadow, and that constituted the Blue Coal Radio Review. All the while, sales of the shadow magazine were mounting, but readers clamored for the radio program to reflect the shadow's magazine adventures. Street and Smith agreed, and a squabble developed between them and Blue Coal that kept the program off the air for two years. Finally, in 1937, Blue Coal agreed to a trial sponsorship of a series that would feature the shadow not as host, but as the central character, and would highlight a different shadow adventure each week over the mutual network. Dramatic license was exercised liberally on the magazine characters, and the shadow became Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town, 
who could cloud men's minds and become invisible. Cranston's secret was shared only by his friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane. Walter Gibson. We began creating a whole new character. Blue Cole came around, uh, or Ruth Ruff and Ryan did, and said, can we use the shadow as an announcer because we find it's a good gimmick? And so Ralston said, well, let them use the shadow, providing they say it's owned by Street and Smith and so forth and so on and so on. And the, the um, people like Blue Cole did not want to make more money out of it. In other words, they said, we'll pay for the whole thing. We don't. Well, we're through with it with one release. That's all we want. So they gave Street and Smith a chance to take it and later uh, reproduce it on recordings through Michelson. And Street and Smith were making money out of it and getting back the money they'd lost in the other thing. So both Nanovic and I agreed that was good because uh, that, that was meant money was coming into the place and they were keeping up the magazine and uh, he was the editor and I was the writer. But as we went along with that, we kept the readers kept writing in. Why don't you have something about the shadow? What is this silly business about the radio program? The announcers say was just a gimmick. So we kept went to Ralston and said we thought that they ought to take the stories from the magazine. In fact, people were saying they should. So we agreed. But the radio people wouldn't have any part of it. Oh no, it was a great announcer. So Ralston took me to along with him to see different people. And among one of the people we went to see were the Tasty East, who had a thing called the Tasty East Jesters. And we were talking about selling them the, the shadow as a dramatic show. And in that case, John and I would have been deputed to start to put this thing together and talk with their radio outfit and so forth. And uh, they decided to stick with what they had, although they were quite interested. And that was a very interesting thing because when I went with Ralston, who treated me like I was a member of a firm. He was a wonderful person. They asked him flatly what was the circulation of the shadow. And nobody had ever mentioned it. And he told them 300,000 an issue. Now comes the funny part. Blue Cole said, we'll pay you something for it. It's right. Street and Smith property. You control the thing, so forth. Do what you want with them. Street and Smith says, yes, but we don't want those. We want programs that have to do with the shadow because we're going to use it to promote the shadow magazine. And all you have to do is look at the ads in the shadow magazine and you can see why they were saying that. And finally, Blue Cole said, we'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take it for one next season. Go ahead, have one of the shadow stories. Let our script department work on them. Because we've got fellows that have been writing the kind of stuff. We'll run it. And if we don't like it, we'll quit. But they said, if it's no good, can we have the shadow back as an announcer? Well, Street and Smith, having nothing to do, said, well, we'd consider that. But let's see how it makes out. It went out, and it was the hit of the year. It was they should have done it three years before, four years before. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to hear it. And the thing that made it was Lamont Cranston and the characters that they brought in. That what we, John Nanovic saw to it that enough could be gotten in. And uh, that was its real making. And that's the program they think of now. Prior to 1937, the part of the shadow had been played briefly by James Lacurto and, for five years, by Frank Reddick. Old radio buffs will forever associate Reddick's voice with one role that has survived the ravages of time, the part of reporter Carl Phillips in the famous 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast by Orson Welles. In 1937, Welles' star was in its ascendancy. Though he was only in his early twenties, Welles had already attracted a large following and was well known in New York theater circles. But Wells craved a national audience, something he believed he could acquire through radio. Announcer, Ken Roberts. To play the part of uh, Lamont Cranston, the uh, whole of radio was scoured, I suppose you might say, to find an actor who would be perfect in the part. And of course they found the actor who was perfect in the part because they went to Orson Welles, who by that time had quite a reputation and had also achieved great fame on Broadway already because he had become perhaps the youngest, most successful producer in the history of Broadway. So here was a young man 
whose name was on everybody's lips, and Blue Cole was smart enough to approach him with the idea of playing Lamont Cranston in this new version of The Shadow. Orson was very, very busy at that time, and it seemed almost impossible for him to take on such an assignment, but uh, great concessions were made so that he would be able to take it on. Among the concessions, well, perhaps the biggest, of course, was that he would not have to attend rehearsal, that uh, the program would be prepared and almost completed, except for his appearance, and when the moment came that they would be ready for him, they were prepared to send for him at the theatre where he would be rehearsing his own company, the Mercury Theatre, and he would come down in a chauffeur-driven limousine or a taxi cab to the studio where we were working. We were at the RCA studio on 24th Street between uh, 3rd Avenue and Lexington Avenue in New York, and Orson was working at the Princess Theatre with the, his Mercury Group. The Princess Theatre was on 39th Street and Broadway. So it wasn't too big a jump for Orson, but he was able to make it. He would hop into his taxi cab or limo, as I said, appear at our studio in about five minutes, walk in, pick up a script, go to the microphone, and start to perform the show. The show was recorded, of course, and that's why we were able to do it in that fashion. Bill Sweets was no longer doing the program in this form. It was now being directed by Clark Andrews. And there was one lovely moment when Orson walked into the studio after being summoned and we were all ready to go to work. He picked up his script, went to the microphone, and suddenly the script fell out of his hands and spread all over the studio floor. Well, there was consternation in the control room. There was fear on the faces of the musicians. Everybody was terribly upset. Suddenly Orson merely smiled, reached into his pocket, and took out another script. The whole thing had been planned to frighten the director. Organist Rosa Rio remembers Orson Welles. Orson Welles was entirely different uh, from the <laughs> character he is today. He was young, very thin, very good looking, and minus ego, minus weight and ego. He was really a lot of fun. I, 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 he was fun in those days and very generous, but he was a real clown. He was an actor every, every inch of, uh, of being an actor every minute of being an actor. For instance, when we would have the break, you know, maybe a five or ten minutes break out on the hour, why, and as everybody else would be uh, resting, not he, he would out be out clowning. Whatever was the picture of that day, that was what he was putting on an act. And I remember the first time a Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs had just opened at Radio City. And he got a broom, he did the witch, he did every part, and he had us just howling. Really, in a way, it was nice because everybody was so relaxed from laughing at him because he could really put on each character. And then you'd go right back into the script. You were very relaxed and really did a really good job. It, it just broke the tension. But I would say he was a riot, and at that at the time, he put on a play on Broadway, too, you know. And he was a very generous guy. Uh, uh, he, he gave several of us tickets to, to go to the show. And uh, he, w he was really very, very lovely, while Agnes Moorhead was very aloof. She was very, very aloof. And uh, the cast, as a rule, were very wonderful. Writer and actor Sidney Sloan. As everybody knows, Orson never rehearsed the show. He had a standby man who would appear er at the time of the rehearsal, and uh, they would mark the script and read the lines just for timing. And uh, when... Uh, Wells would walk in at the opening, uh, just about the time we were, uh, the show was on the air, and he'd walk in and he'd hand him the script and he'd go into who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men in that business. And uh, he would go through it. Well, he got to the middle break this one time, and then they took it away for the commercial in another studio, and he said, hey, this is a hell of a script. How does it end? Here he's playing the show. Walter Gibson. It meant nothing to Orson, that first series. Uh, what happened was the Mercury Theater wanted, uh, they all wanted jobs on Sunday because they were not playing on Sunday and they all decided to get in radio and they decided if they could take over a radio show, it would be great. And the only show that happened to come up that was open was The Shadow. So they took it and they had it for two seasons. Ken Roberts. I think I should tell you 
about some of the actors who appeared on The Shadow in those years. There were such wonderful names as Everett Sloan, Frank Reddick, whom I mentioned before, who went on from being the narrator on the original show to being one of Orson's company. There was Paul Stewart, there was Martin Gable, Arlene Francis, Alice Frost, who had been playing the lead in Big Sister, another successful radio serial, and many, many others. Finally, Orson was ready to go on to bigger things. He was ready to go on from the theater to Hollywood for the production of Citizen Kane. And so we no longer would have Orson, and we were sure the show would go off the air, as I just mentioned. But wonder of wonders, it did not. The program was strong enough to continue with other people in the role of Lamont Cranston. One of the first of them was Bill Johnstone. Johnstone had played supporting roles on The Shadow under Wells, and in the fall of 1938 won the part of Lamont Cranston over the almost 80 other actors who auditioned for it. Johnstone played the role of The Shadow for five seasons. Agnes Moorhead continued as Margot Lane until 1940. Here is a brief excerpt from Can the Dead Talk, the program that concluded The Shadow's fifth season on March 19, 1939. It was vitally necessary that Lamont Cranston should be thought dead so that Voltan would keep his knowledge of the Shadow's identity to himself until I had time to figure a way out. But, Lamont, why didn't you tell me and spare me the suffering? I wouldn't have given you away. I didn't dare uh, take the chance. Voltan might have read your thoughts. A sinister man, Margot, with some rather extraordinary mental capabilities. Would it surprise you to know that he had perfected plans for a world revolt? He had? You mean he... Yes. Voltan is dead. As the ghost of the shadow, I faced him tonight in a haunted house... When he thought his mental powers were going back on him, he shot his servant, who very conveniently strangled Voltan before he died, too. Oh, terrible. Oh, I don't think so, Margot. There's quite enough unrest among nations today without the machinations of an insane mental genius. Yes, I think the world will be a great deal better off without Mr. Voltan. It's a pity that others with a like capacity for stirring up trouble can't meet the same fate. Now, friends, we have a real treat in store for you. I want you to meet two grand actors. Our stars, Margot Lane, who in reality is the charming Agnes Moorhead, and Lamont Cranston, who is known in real life as Bill Johnstone. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Well, Margot, oh, <laughs> I should say Agnes, I know you'll agree with me that it's been a great privilege for you and me to have played the roles of Margot Lane and The Shadow for the past six months. Yes, it has, Bill, and it's been a lot of fun besides... I can't begin to tell you how much I've appreciated being with the Shadow during his exciting adventures. And I know that we appreciate the generous cooperation we have received from our sponsors, the Blue Coal Dealers, in teaching young and old alike that crime doesn't pay. If we succeeded in driving home that moral, then we'll have accomplished our purpose. As Ken Roberts has told you, ladies and gentlemen, this is our final broadcast of the winter season. But we sincerely hope to be back with another series in the fall. Whether or not the Shadow Program returns is up to you, our listeners. In the theater, you know, we actors can tell by the applause if the audience enjoys our efforts to entertain them. But in radio, the only way to know whether or not the audience enjoys the entertainment is by their purchases of the product that makes the program possible or by their personal approval to the sponsors. So, friends... If you've liked this Shadow series and want to hear the show again next fall, won't you phone or write your nearest Blue Coal dealer and let him know? Your purchases of Blue Coal and your phone calls to the Blue Coal dealers will indicate to them whether or not they should bring you the Shadow program again in September. And now, on behalf of our entire cast, hearty thanks to you again for your loyalty to our show and your support of Blue Coal. Goodbye, Bill and Agnes. And we hope you'll be back again in the fall. And friends, remember that you can continue to thrill to the adventures of the shadow during the summer months 
by getting the Shadow Magazine at your local newsstand. This is Ken Roberts saying goodbye for Blue Coal. In 1943, Johnstone left the part of the Shadow to seek his acting fortune in Hollywood. Brett Morrison, a popular Chicago radio actor, new to New York, landed the role of Lamont Cranston. Theater Time, Broadway. Once again, you're invited to attend the opening night performance of a new play in the Little Theater off Times Square. All theater land thrills to those magic words, opening night. It's a supreme moment for the producer. It's the acid test for the author and the actors. They're all wagering their time and talent on their ability to please the public taste for entertainment. Will they succeed tonight? I was doing Mr. First Nighter, which was also a mutual show out of Chicago. It used to come on right after The Shadow. The Shadow came on, and then First Nighter came on out of Chicago. So I always used to hear the tail end of The Shadow, the closing signature, the weed of crime bears bitter fruit, crime does not pay, while we're getting our last-minute corrections and waiting to go on the air. Then the uh, war, of course, broke out, and, of course, everything came to a dead stop as far as radio and all was concerned. I went into special service. When I got out of the Army, I came on to New York because I was stationed in Boston, First Service Command. I got a call. I was doing a show called The Falcon, which was about the first mm -hmm. show I got here in New York, just playing character on it. It wasn't the uh, title role. And I got a call for an audition. I didn't know what it was for. It was Ruth Rolf and Ryan. It was the advertising agency. And they just called me for an audition. And I was supposed to be there, I don't know, say, 1 o'clock or something like that. Not later than 1 o'clock. They were losing the studio at 1 o'clock. And I was on the air at the Falcon, or I'm not sure about the time of the audition, but anyway, right up practically to the last minute. So by the time I got there, it was about four minutes to the hour when they were going to lose the... Uh, the studio. So I ran in and they just said, well, there isn't time to do anything. Just read this. It's the opening and closing signatures and just read it. And it was the opening and closing signature of The Shadow. And I just read it the way I always remembered it yeah. and left. And that was that. And I thought, well, you know, forget it. <laughs> and a couple of days later, I got a call saying, you're it. In 1966, Morrison and Grace Matthews, who played Margot Lane from 1946 to 1949, met to reminisce about their long associations with the Shadow program. Orson Welles was the first one to do the Shadow when he became an integral part of the story itself. Before that, there were two or three when the Shadow was merely um, sort of a host. He was like Raymond of Inner Sanctum. He never appeared in the story, the body of the story, but he was merely the host who presented the thing, they set up the framework, and then they had a some sort of a cops and robbers well, thing. Now, wasn't Bill Johnstone one of those? Bill Johnstone preceded me. Orson Welles oh, Orson I Welles see. is before Bill Johnstone. I see. And before him, uh, I think uh, Mr. Reddick was one of the original shadows before he became part of the story. Brett Morrison was the shadow more than any other actor that played the part. From all accounts, Orson Welles allocated precisely one hour of his time per week to the role. Half of that hour was spent in transit to and from the studio. The role was calculated to serve as a stepping stone to greater things, to bring Welles to the attention of the general public. William Johnstone, a competent radio actor who followed Welles, did not involve himself to any great degree in the Cranston role. But Brett Morrison took the role seriously. He carried himself like the star of the program, demonstrating the caring, the concern a true star often feels for the success of his enterprise. The people looked the way you wanted them to look. The places looked the way you imagined yes. them. And now with television, it's a fait accompli. I mean, you accept mm -hmm. it, and if you don't like it, you turn it off and go to something else. But that was the beauty of radio. It, it helped to stimulate the imagination. And in comparison, now they sound very corny when you listen to some of these old shows. Because we've made such tremendous strides uh, technically and uh, also performance-wise. In radio, everything had to be spelled out in large capital letters so that, you know, I've got you covered with <laughs> this gun, you know, so that it was clear to the audience what was happening. 
which today makes it seem kind of corny. But that was the beauty of radio, and that's the thing that I think is, is missing in our entertainment today. Shadow expert Anthony Tolan. Rick Morrison was a real renaissance man. He was a singer, a writer, he wrote a couple episodes of The Shadow, a composer, a director. After radio, he was a dubbing director on foreign films where he would produce the English soundtracks for years. He was a master at it. Uh, he was an interior decorator. He designed uh, Mercedes McCambridge's apartment. He was an all-around performer, writer, singer, composer, musician, very fine pianist, and he really was Lamont Cranston to a large degree, and he had the elegance of Bill Johnstone, for example, as Lamont Cranston, but he also had the power of Orson Welles. For several years in the mid-40s, the Shadow program originated before a live theater audience. Brett Morrison, typically, went the extra mile. In scenes where Cranston became the shadow, and solely for the benefit of the theater audience, as the radio audience could not see him, Morrison would don his own cape and slouch hat to match the appearance of the shadow as he was depicted in the shadow magazine. In preparing this program, we talked with more than a dozen of Morrison's contemporaries on the shadow. Not one had anything but praise for this fine actor. This is quite amazing, but you'd be surprised how many adults actually thought that Lamont Cranston was a true character who had the power to make himself invisible. Because toward the end of the program, or somewhere around, I think, when we were in Korea, uh, we would receive letters I'd receive letters from people saying, we think it's a crime that you're keeping the shadow here when he could be spying for our country, you know, again. Really? Oh, yes. Yes, it's really fantastic. Isn't I had no idea that, that, amazing? that uh, I've, I've seen this happen, uh, identity happen in uh, daytime radio, you know, with yes. characters. They, yes. They think they actually exist. Yes. And it's, uh, I don't know how they... they uh, correlate the time element that at a certain time they're <laughs> able to eavesdrop on their lives. Recently Grace Matthews recalled how she felt auditioning for the part of Margot Lane in 1946. I was so frozen with fear that um, I don't remember, I mean I just blanked out. Uh, oh, it was a very popular show and it was a great plum to get, you know. And so I thought, oh no, I, you know, and so I just went in I, I didn't think I had a chance. I mean, all the people in New York who'd, you know, worked so much in New York and they all knew each other and I was an outsider and they'd look at me and, you know, who's she anyway? So I was scared to death. It was such a nice director, though, and he was, he, he was a, you know, one of those rare, beautiful people that try so much to put you at ease. It was impossible to put me at ease, but, but he did try. It was um, midsummer when I auditioned, and of course, the sh I don't think the sh I think the show was off, and we didn't go on to start again until September. But then we were doing it in the in the Long Acre Theater, and that's when I first met Brett Morrison, and be he became such a dear friend, just most marvelous man. Approximately nine hundred shadow programs were produced. Two hundred of these, with the shadow as host prior to his becoming the central character. Of the 700 programs that featured Lamont Cranston, about 200 are known to have survived, and of these, around 100 are available commercially on disc. The 200 programs in circulation, either commercially or traded among collectors, are fairly evenly divided between performances by Johnstone and Morrison, with Wells, who did fewer programs to begin with, in third place. But the actress heard most often today in the role of Margot Lane is the lovely and very gracious Grace Matthews. From the time I took over the part, it, it was an audience program, and it was at the Long Acre Theater off just uh, 44th Street, Broadway. And we would have, during the week, we would have in a studio just 
a read through mostly for timing and any changes you know that had to be made then we would gather at one o'clock on Sundays and start rehearsing um, the show went on the air at five o'clock the audience would come in about 4.30 um, it it was just really a great experience and, and the audiences I mean the house was jammed every 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 Sunday you know it was marvelous and this went on for a long time and then I discovered that um, I was going to have a child and so I went to the director and said look I'm sorry if you uh, if you have to fire me up but uh, I mean that that's the situation <laughs> he said grace relax now look we can um, we'll go on doing it in the theater as long as as possible and then we will just move into a studio for a few weeks so we moved to WOR studios and and, and did it there until that little episode was over and then we came back to the theater so that's how all that um, but you know Brett was um, simply marvelous it was a long rehearsal day and um, everybody we, at the beginning we used to have a lunch break and, and in the Broadway area it was a little difficult on a Sunday to find something to eat so he used to arrive with his houseman with a big picnic basket with food for everybody and it was it was lovely delicate food scrumptious food and so we'd all just sit around and relax and enjoy it he I, I this man was a saint really just dear and so talented so that's how we got out of the theater and then back into the theater <laughs> Oh, it was great fun. It was, it was, it was one of the highlights of the week, as far as I was concerned, because they had some of the best actors, and it was, was so beautifully cast. You know, they'd come on for one show. Right? Oh, all, all the character people in the, all, the, particularly the men, all the character men, the best character men there were were there, and they were in tough guys and all sorts of, you know, and it, it was just, it was a wonderful cast, and. I felt a bit um, uneasy at first because here were these people. I mean, I'd had a lot of experience, but they were all tough New Yorkers now, and, and um, I think they were, I mean, I forget who I replaced, but maybe they all loved her, and, um, and maybe uh, they resented me. You know, you know that feeling that you can get. We asked Miss Matthews about audience reaction to The Shadow. I got a lot of reaction. I got a lot of mail, but I also got some frightening reaction that these um, court was going. He was away over most most all weekends. He went up to Canada to to do the um, Imperial Oil hockey broadcast, on, and he'd leave on Friday night and come back Monday morning. And of course, the shadow was on Sunday, so you know I was there alone. And I get these kids who would phone up and really. At first it was kind of fun. They'd say, oh, Marco, we'll meet you in the cemetery or something like this. But then finally it got a bit scary. And then they would come around to our apartment and left signs all over with kind of nasty words and stuff. It was just, uh, it got um, too much, you know. But mostly the, the mail was marvelous. It was, it was a great response. I don't know. I mean, you certainly a daytime soap. You got a lot of mail soap, but I think it was equally as as big. Miss Matthews recalls with good humor an amusing domestic difficulty she had with her husband, actor Court Benson. Court is a great baseball fan, and there was always a, a game on on Sunday afternoon, and um, so I come home and I'd say, uh, "Did you hear the shadow? Did you hear the show today?" Um, oh yeah, yes, yes, Grace. I yeah, I heard it, and this went on. I thought, well, my goodness, I this is great lack of enthusiasm. So I finally said, D did you really? He said, well, off and on, you know. I was listening to the baseball, and then I'd switch a little bit to the shadow and so forth. So there was one non-fan, wasn't it? <laughs> During much of the Morrison Matthews collaboration. The Shadow was announced by Andre Baruch. My own recollections of The Shadow are rather vague because of my failing memory. 
and having announced a zillion programs in radio and TV throughout the intervening years. Plus, the confusion in my mind as to who played what when. I remember I followed Ken Roberts as the announcer on The Shadow. I do not remember how I was picked, probably by the agency, Ruth Roth and Ryan. I know that Brett Morrison played the lead, of course. Unfortunately, this fine actor is no longer with us. On your marks, everyone, get ready to play quick as a flash. <laughs> From 1944 to 1951, another radio incarnation of The Shadow was as a guest detective on the popular Quick as a Flash quiz program. Oh, good morning, everybody. This is Bill Cullen bringing you radio's most exciting quiz game, Quick as a Flash. And for an extra special treat as guest detective in the mystery contest today, and all this week, as a matter of fact, you're going to meet one of your favorite radio detectives, Lamont Cranston, The Shadow. And hey, at the end of our show, we have our pyramid contest, which today is worth $565. And now, everybody, get ready to act quick as a flash, because here we go. <laughs> Well, here we are with that quick as a flash mystery problem we told you about. And in this contest, we give our contestants the opportunity to play detective by presenting a puzzle in crime. To set the stage for us all this week, we've invited... Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> yes, it's Brett Morrison, known to all of you as Lamont Cranston, alias The Shadow. Hey, now... Now, the contestant who first spots the clue which solves the mystery will be ordered $20. And now it's my great pleasure to present Lamont Cranston, the shadow in Death Pays the Call. Again, announcer Andre Baruch. The only incident that sticks in my mind about doing the shadow was the fact that I almost missed one of the programs. I was involved in the finals of a golf tournament in Westchester, New York, which is about 40 minutes away from the WOR studios in Manhattan. I won the match on the 18th hole and suddenly realized that I had just 40 minutes to get to the studio. Without changing clothes or shoes, I jumped into the cars, sped down the West Side Highway, cutting in and out of lanes in a desperate effort to get there on time. Traffic on this particular Sunday was inordinately heavy, and as time ticked away, it looked as if my unblemished record of having never missed a program was about to be broken. I arrived in the lobby of the studio 30 seconds before airtime, grabbed an elevator, got off at the 20th floor, rushed in with five seconds left, pulled the script from the hands of the producer who was about to take my place, and breathlessly announced... Once again, your neighborhood blue coal dealer brings you the thrilling adventures of The Shadow, etc., etc. The actress who played Margot Lane longest from 1949 through the end of the network run in 1954 is the beautiful and charming Gertrude Warner. Recently, in her New York apartment, Miss Warner recalled her days on The Shadow. We, we would sometimes do three and four shows a day running from CBS to NBC and sometimes would turn down work at WOR because it was too far away. It was on 40th. Anyway, some gal said to me, you going to audition for The Shadow? I said, yeah, what's going on? I hear they're replacing. What's going on? I said, I don't know. Well, I said, we'll find out when we get there. I was dressed up in my best navy blue dress and three strand choker pearls. So down I went, we were all sitting around 15 or 20 of us, and uh, so I read the lines, and then the director said, now we have to hear you scream, because Margot screams most of the time, underwater, wherever, she has to scream. I said, you really want to? Said, yes. So I had been studying with uh, Kay Thompson, and she was tell me how to use the diaphragm. She said, you don't have to <gasps> just take a little quick breath and you will scream forever. Well, I did that. Took a little intake. This choker broke. It was like a hailstorm. Pearls were bouncing through that. I was trying to catch them. Finally gave up. It was up where he had to be there. And I got outside and they said, what was going on in there? I said, I don't know about my pearls. I said, 
He'll do anything to get a job. He'll just do anything. So I, I think that's why I got that job. I really do. Miss Warner recalls an incident with shadow director Chick Vincent. He had a very high-pitched voice. He talked, all right, all right, let's go. And uh, when I first started, I, I said, Chick, uh, how, how would you like this place? Fast and sexy, honey, fast and sexy. Well, anyway, he was, he was a darling guy. One day on the air, the bad guy was supposed to shoot somebody. It was supposed to be a shot, and I was supposed to scream, and then Brett was supposed to come in. Well, there was a sound man, and the cue for the shot, and we had click click, click, the darn gun wouldn't go off. Suddenly, Chick comes roaring out of the control room and says, bang, 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 bang. That was live. Miss Warner made a career out of playing the detective's girlfriend. She starred on Perry Mason and Ellery Queen, as well as on The Shadow. By the time I did it, it was WOR. That was a beehive. It was Nick Carter next door. There were shows going on there all day long. It was like a small town, really. There were so few of us. And we were dashing in and out, and, and uh, we got to know each other so well. We knew how we would react. Uh, once, only once did I do this. We broke up on the air, and that was awful. We could not get control of ourselves. It was, uh, that was William Redfield. And Bill had dancing blue eyes. And he could look at me, I, I couldn't, I couldn't. I always worked with my script in front of my face. I said, Billy, don't do this to me, because I was gone. I was just gone. And one day there was a very pompous uh, character actor. And the leading lady's name on that particular thing, her name was Ginny. Well, he got up to the microphone. He said, ah, that's a good girl, Giddy, uh, Ginny. Well. Redfield looked over at me, and we were finished. We were all through. So every time I saw Redfield, he'd say, Ah, Guinea! How are you today, Guinea? Oh, oh, so funny, so funny. But, but they were people with very quick reactions. You just didn't have time to, to study a lot, so therefore we were accused of being slick. We probably were. Because they said, you have radio people in the theater. The first reading is what you get. You're not going to get any better. But they were, they were lovely people. We helped each other. It seems so funny to me. It's all gone and will never return. It seems so funny. Because I, I can't think really of anybody. That There was one actor who was... We had a lot of stand-ins. We all had stand-ins. I understand Orson Welles never uh, rehearsed. He always used to stand in. The late Santos Ortega played police commissioner Weston on The Shadow for many years. Santos Ortega smoked a cigar and we'd be standing here with our script and he'd set it on fire and so we had to read faster and faster and faster and faster, and faster before our, our page burned uh, well we took that in great good spirit or he'd blow cigarette ashes uh, cigar ashes in our face or somebody wouldn't show up and we'd, we'd for instance, I'd point to you and you'd read that line and then I'd read the next line we'd cover. And we just did that automatically. I don't know. I think maybe the shows were terrible. I don't know. Miss Warner remembers well working with Brett Morrison. When I first started, we had a longer rehearsal. I guess the budget was better. And so we would go and have maybe an hour and a half for dinner, then go back and record. And I had just had a wild experience with a... Um, an organist I dearly loved, I worked with, who died, and he was a, um, he believed in reincarnation. So I was laughing, I said, the crazy atmosphere. And Brett was sitting there, he had a very, um, he, he said himself he looked like Buddha. In later years he got quite heavy. And when he didn't wear his hairpiece, you know, it was all skin. And he said, well, I had uh, several lives. Well, of course, I felt so silly. I said, you did? He said, yes. I was killed in the uh, Roman, uh, where is that place where the gladiators were? And I died. I was a parent. My parents were French peasants at some point. And I was a poet, and they wanted me to work in the fields. So I died in that life at age 29. Because I just was laughing about this story. I said, well, 
Brett, how do you how do you find out about these things? He said, well, there's a place in Chicago. You can write and give your name, and they will give you all the information about your past lives. And he, he really believed that. He went on and on. His name was Bert, and he changed it, of course, to Brett because of those, whatever they told him there. It was a very high-pressure business. You had to quickly sight-read. You couldn't be afraid. You had to be solid. If somebody missed a cue, you had to cover. Always good to have Con and Brett to do that. Um, he was a very quiet personality. Um, used to cook food. Was a marvelous cook. Had a long Rolls Royce. He drove me to his country place, and he sat up where the chauffeur was. And I said, "Let me stretch out in the back." I couldn't. Uh, couldn't touch the end of the car. He'd sit down and sing. Um, he then became an executive at an Italian place where they did lip syncing. He was wonderful at that. But Brett could pick up a page and memorize it as he went. Gee, that's wonderful. I can't do that. I was on it for five years, and gradually they reduced the rehearsal time until at the end it was really pretty shabby. We didn't have any rehearsal at all. It's like, all right, look your script over, and then we'll go. And what they said was, if it isn't uh, good, we'll recut the line. But of course they never did. And um, we used to have an organist, and then we just had uh, recordings. So they were all right, but they were mechanical. So really, at the end, I was sort of glad, because it was a travesty. The scripts got worse and worse and worse. It was, it's like an aging actress ha ha having too many farewell performances. You know, it was time. It really was. To, I don't know how Brett felt, felt about it. He didn't express any great regret and then about a year later we were called to Y&R to do Marco in the shadow in a commercial audition and we did that and then we walked back up Madison Avenue and said well Trude if they do it they won't use us they'll get kids who are younger ha 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 and I think that's the last time I ever saw Brett uh, he subsequently moved to Palm Springs, I guess. I had a lot of things around here that he's given me because if you went to his house, you'd say, gee, that's pretty. It would come in the mail. Being the star of a network radio series was not necessarily a lucrative business, but there were other rewards as well. We asked Miss Warner how much she earned playing Margot Lane. Hey, it was very cheap. They only paid 75 I don't. I think Brett got more. It was cheap. It was cheap. I'd be out in Long Island or any part. Well, what do you do for a living? Oh, well, I'm in radio. Well, anything we've ever heard. And I would mention all of these, what I thought were the classy shows. Oh, hmm, mm, hmm, mm. Then there came the shadow. The shadow? George, come in here. She plays Margolina. And we began to see that it had, that that was stockbrokers, lawyers, stockers loved that show. It was, it was funny. And I liked it because I said, well, we're not making any money, but it's a lot of fun. We could jazz around. Maybe the dress rehearsal, we'd, we'd do accents or do crazy things. And the director could trust us because he knew that we knew what we were doing. You know, when you've done a show that long, it was, it was enormous fun. It was always a bad guy. Uh, Brett always came to the rescue. We'd spend a lot of time on the screens and being choked. Then once I was sitting talking with somebody and uh, Brett was trying to rescue me and he said, if, if, if anything's happened to Margo, I'll, that was my cue to scream from the cellar where I was, well, I was just talking to somebody and poor Brett was going, well, I'll, I'll, well, I'll, 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 and finally I looked over and he was, oh, <laughs> where I sat. But anyway, he, uh, he could ad lib uh, his way out of that to cover for me. So I guess that's why, yeah, they were crazy. It is ironic that although Miss Warner played the role of Margot most recently, only one of her more than 200 performances is known to be in existence today. We just thought it was going to go on forever. I mean, we just didn't believe it was going to die. I remember I went to a crazy astrologer, bald as a billiard ball, but he had one hunk of hair, like a chicken, just, and 
he said, you are going to lose all your work within a year. So when I left, I thought, <laughs> what does he know? But it's true. It all went off. When I first started doing it, it seems to me we started on a Sunday at 1. And I think it went on at 5 or 5.30. Uh, then gradually we'd show up at 3. And we would just have a, a quick 1-2. And uh, instead of rehearsal, then Chick or whoever would go to the organist and say, cue here, music here, and so forth. And then as time went on, instead of a careful timing, uh, we would watch the control room and we'd get a signal, you know, stretch it out or you better pick it up. And that's the way it was, it was sort of not well done. And if you fluffed, fine. But then you see, uh, we didn't fluff very often. Or if we did, we covered for each other. But it got sloppier and sloppier. And then as I say, when they got rid of the organist and they had these bad, I don't know, what were they, 38s? What was the, 78s? And those would wow in sometimes. The engineer had to do that. Oh, you know, the music would come in. It was just kind of sloppy. And then they weren't paying very much for scripts. Sometimes they didn't make any sense. And, uh, of course, we were so used to it. But the people coming in maybe were thrown off a little because they didn't get to rehearsal. It was cold. And so sometimes they'd miss a cue. I was kind of glad it was over. Perhaps the person most responsible for preserving the shadow broadcasts and continuing their tenure on American airwaves is California program syndicator Charles Michelson. We interviewed him recently in his Beverly Hills offices. There was Superman who could do other things. He was a Superman. And there were other people who could do other odd activities. But that was the shadow's uh, thing, and he was alone with it at the time of being able to cloud men's minds so that others could not see him. Michelson's long association with the shadow dates back to the 1930s. It was a live production. It originated from the Empire Theater in New York before an audience of maybe five, six hundred people. It was a famous theater, the Empire Theater. And uh, different from the musical programs where uh, they would send out a comic or somebody to pep up the audience and liven them up. The stage, the, the, the curtain uh, was lowered, was down, and it, the theater went black, went dark. And there was nothing other than mysterioso music from the organ to set the mood. And finally, when the time arrived, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the curtain went up and the show went on. And everybody acted in front of this audience who were instructed not to make any noise or emotions, and uh, they produced the show. The program was sponsored in the eastern part of the United States by the Delaware Lackawanna D and Western Coal Company, DL and W Coal. But that was only in the eastern area where they sold anthracite, hard coal. I undertook to sell the program in the rest of the country. And so in the Midwest, it was run by uh, Groves Coal Tablets, four way coal tablets, and they also sponsored on the Pacific Coast. In the mountain area, we had the program sold to a salt company. And so there were actually three different sponsors on the program. In order to provide for the commercials, the DL and W, the Blue Coal commercial announcer, stood center stage. The Groves four way coal tablet announcer was in a telephone booth on the left-hand side of the stage while the Cary Salt Company announcer for the mountain area was also in a telephone booth on the right-hand side of the stage. It was up to the director to guide all three so that the commercials would all come out and finish at the same time. Heavens forbid if they didn't. 
any program on the air for as long as the shadow was has to have had some embarrassing moments. Charles Michelson recalls two such incidents. James Monks was one of the regular actors in the show, and um, he was a very popular actor at the time. This Jimmy Monks had another show that he was doing at another network from about uh, uh, 2.30 to 4.30, and um, knowing that he could do his part quite well, very well in fact, uh, he was allowed to do this other show, and he would have a car waiting, standing by for him at the other studio, so that in the half hour time period, he could make it comfortably to our show. This particular day, I uh, hadn't realized it, but there was a parade going on in Midtown New York, and all the streets were closed off. However, uh, our rehearsal got through, and we were ready to go on the air, and there was no Jimmy Monks. Fortunately, his part didn't begin until a little bit later on into the show. And uh, we tried to locate him, made phone calls, and finally he rushes through the doors into the studio. Everyone heaved a sigh of relief. He picked up his script and he began to emote. The only problem was that he was reading from the wrong page. <laughs> and the person who had died about five minutes ago was still alive, walking along around without a head. <laughs> and uh, things like that uh, did happen occasionally. There was another instance I recall where the engineer, when we were playing for the West Coast and so on, they didn't have the uh, systems as they have now, but we ran repeats for the West Coast. And an engineer, probably not thinking or something, picked up part two of the program and put it on the turntable, reali not realizing that part one on the other turntable should have been the one he was playing. So he started part two, he came to the end of the story, and there was a half hour time period left with nothing to fill, so he put part one on. It appeared in the newspapers the following Monday morning. There was a terrible catastrophe. Of course, in order for an error to be made, there must first be a script from which to err. You have a man above and beyond the normal man who cannot be hurt and can and is a good man and he helps you out of a bad spot and he he always makes a thing that's wrong right. Sidney Sloan acted in and wrote many shadow scripts. I invented Shrevey. Shrevey was my invention. Maybe I didn't create the name, but I created the the, the type of character he was a, a Brooklynese cab driver who thinks that he can settle the whole idea was that he would have a theory about how the crime was committed and he would tell it to uh, Lamont Cranston and Lamont would always laugh at it and say it's funny and it would always be a completely wrong idea. In the late 40s, Sloan also served as script editor. But his first shadow script, Phantom Fingerprints, aired early on in the series. What's a murderer electrocuted eight years ago got to do with the death of the doctor? I don't know the answer to that, Commissioner. But there's an odd similarity in the murder technique. And as Dr. Giles pointed out, the weapon used on Dr. Kilgore left the same tri-cornered mark as found on Novelli's victims. Yes, everything is the same. Why, if I didn't know Novelli was dead and buried, I'd say he was our man. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, gentlemen. I can see exactly what you're thinking. Killer Novelli comes back from the dead to kill a man he never had anything against. Oh, no, no, Grant. All right, all right, Commissioner. Now, uh... What about fingerprints? As I told you before, Cranston, a smart criminal doesn't leave his prints around. Oh, but O'Reilly found a clean-cut set of prints right in the center of your desk, Chief. He's down on the files right now, checking up on them. What? On my desk? You say a complete set of prints was found? Four fingers and a thumb, all perfect. No smudges. Perfect? Well, you're very fortunate, Weston. Phantom Fingerprints was the first script I wrote, and I, I know exactly the story about that is interesting, because I was acting on the show the week before... And uh, Bill Tuttle was directing. This is a, a new uh, assignment for him. And Bill was an old friend of mine from Chicago, and we'd been at the Goodman Theater together. And Bill called me and said, oh, um, several times, I'd worked on the show several times before, and uh, we were doing a script. I don't know whose it was, but he said to me, hey, this is a hell of a script, isn't it? It's a marvelous show. 
I said, no, Bill, this is pretty hackneyed. Uh, this has been done before, and it, it, it's, there's very little originality in the script, and it should look for some new sharp points that would attract an audience, because when they hear this, they're going to say, I can't tell you what the story was at this point. But the audience will say, oh my God, they're doing that one again. You know, the mad scientist or something in business where he's going to blow up the world. And he said, well, if you think you can do better than this, why the hell don't you write for me? I was writing for quite a few other shows at the time. I said, all right. So I wrote a script, and that was the, fir the first one, was The Phantom Fingerprints. The whole idea was when, they f when the police found a body floating in the river, and the, uh, the fingerprints were so swollen and, and changed that they couldn't get an, an absolute uh, print that was clear what they would do is, is remove the skin on the fingers and put them into a, onto a glove and, and make an impression with these fingerprints that was much clearer than they could get from the dead man well my idea was that someone could pretend to be a, a someone who was already dead for a year or two had been executed or something and the, they got hold of his fingerprints and were able to leave his signature on, the, on every crime he did which they loved, they loved that one but it was based on an actual true incident Today's story, Sandhog Murders <laughs> Deep under the river, knee-deep in glacial muck and slime, you'll find them. The sandhogs, working under terrible pressure. Pressure beating against their eardrums. Pressure forcing little nitrogen bubbles into their bloodstreams. Pressure that causes death. Pressure that keeps the river out of the tunnel that men are building under the river. One hundred feet under the river. Sandhog murders was an interesting one because I actually went down when they were building the, uh, the, uh, the East River the 33rd Street tunnel I got permission to go down there and I came down and I was, it was a pressure tunnel and it was rather frightening because we were in something like uh, 50 pounds per square inch or something and we had to get used to it slowly and you're in the pressure and you're alright when you come out you've got to come out slowly it puts you in a, in a tank to release the, uh, the pressure and it was a little frightening but a marvelous feeling later because I was able to get the feeling of the uh, the fright that you feel when you're under the and then they told me about things that happened where the the pressure got so great underneath that they would blow right out into the river the, the, they would blow the men right out into the river today's story murder in the death house <laughs> o'clock in the evening. Margot is in the office of Wilson M. Tuttle, head of the new reform party called the Citizens Committee. Tuttle was our director, and I used his name just for fun, and also because we could get a release from him, Wilson Tuttle. We asked Sidney Sloan how long he took to write a shadow script. Never more than eight hours. Never more, sometimes less. And I'll tell you what, they used to say to me, what if, what's your next story? We've got a story for us. And I'd give him a title without knowing what the story was. And I'd write this, the story from the title. And that's being sitting down, and I, you know, I'd start at midnight, uh, looking at a blank wall with, a, with an old Underwood typewriter in front of me. And I'd start writing the darn story, and I'd end up by falling asleep on the typewriter. But the whole thing finished, but I was too tired to go upstairs and go to bed. I was in the, in the cellar of the house in the basement of the house that we had. 200 was a lot of money in those days. When, when uh, I first got associated with the show, I said to him, well, good God, if he can become uh, invisible at will, all he has to do is follow the man he suspects around and catch him, that's all. He said, oh no, forget that. Forget that. What you do is you write a good, straight mystery story, and then you throw the shadow in, to solve it. I mean, you bring him in, sometimes you bring him in to the last minute. You bring him through in a light way as Lamont Cranston. Then when he becomes a shadow is when you throw him into the plot. 
and uh, it worked the audience loved it I remember we had um, the Crosby rating at that time and I remember that that, uh, that the rating was up on Sundays something like 19.5 which was it was the highest dramatic show on the air a mystery show of course you had to keep it clean and the same rules about uh, sex or um, uh, even mentioning pregnancy or anything like that was taboo dope was absolutely taboo alcoholism was taboo except for the villain the heavy he could be a, something of an alcoholic but no one who was a decent guy could ever be a drunkard one question listeners always seem to raise concerns the propriety of the lamont margot relationship especially during the period that the shows were originally broadcast brett morrison and grace matthews well you know i've wondered about that many <laughs> yes. times myself we sort of cavorted all over the world know, you know, know and had this yes. strange relationship I know. It's, it's absolutely true <laughs> Here were two unmarried adults, man and woman, who were not only completely at home in each other's living quarters, but traveled the world together and addressed each other as darling Grace Matthews. I've heard our friends joke about, you know, about, now look, really, sort of thing. But, but I don't think that was a big, a big thing in it because it was kind of, there was an unreality about it. Sidney Sloan. The whole idea was to, to keep it a little bit naughty without really saying anything because we always thought that, uh, that uh, this was a love affair, Lamont, and because uh, it had gone on so long they were almost like man and wife. You know, there was no love making on the show, and, and, but they were very uh, fond of each other. This is the whole idea. It never went beyond that. But uh, we always, in, in the people mixed up in the show, always made cracks about their relationship they were always kidding the people who were pl who played Lamont and uh, and Margot before today's episode comes to an end here's John Barclay Blue Coal's heating expert thank you Ken Roberts and good evening everyone every fall and winter thousands upon thousands of people burn up money needlessly in heating their homes they pile on excess coal in their efforts to get satisfactory heating results I never realize that their furnace is to blame for their failure. Announcer, Ken Roberts. Another uh, well-known character on The Shadow was John Barkley, the eminent heating expert who came on to the show every uh, Sunday right after the, at the very end of the show to give his heating advice. And uh, the part of John Barkley was played in those early days by a wonderful old actor by the name of Tim Frawley. Tim had been a star for many, many years on the stage, not necessarily on the Broadway stage, but on stages all over the United States. He was what was known then as a stock actor. We had stock companies then all over the country, and Tim Frawley was one of the most popular of all the stock company stars. By the time I met him, of course, he was already an old man, but a dear, sweet old man, and we all enjoyed working with him on The Shadow. There came a time when uh, Tim had to leave. He guess he got just too old to do the part, and he was replaced by Paul Huber, whom I think continued to be John Barclay until the very, very end of the run of The Shadow. Sonically, The Shadow's power to cloud men's minds was obtained by the use of a filter microphone, a device that can be adjusted to selectively attenuate measured amounts of the lower vocal frequencies. In the story Guest of Death, for example, the shadow allows himself to materialize into Lamont Cranston before the very eyes of that particular week's guest maniac. As Cranston materialized, the sound engineer progressively withdrew the filter microphone effect. Enough of that now. Lie down. Chicken-hearted old hound. Just like a human, you fear death too. That fool, Mr. Cranston, I sent to eternity today. He was afraid of death. But that didn't save him. He's no more. He's dead. And I'll send many others after him. <laughs> what was that? Who's there? <laughs> Who's out there? Is that you, Mort? No, Keezy. Mort is well down the hill now. 
There's nobody out there. I'm right here, in your house. Right here in the room with you. I know where you are. You're in this closet. <laughs> you see, I'm not in the closet. I'm right here, behind you. Who are you? What do you want? You, Kesey. I've come for you. Don't you touch me. Don't you come near me. <laughs> Surely you're not afraid of death. Death? Remember, only fools fear death, Kesey. Get out! <laughs> Get out! I'll brain you! I'll kill you here! <laughs> you have a poor aim, Kesey. Get out! Get out! You see, it's useless, Kesey. You can't destroy what you can't see. Why have you come here? To end your criminal career. I've committed no crime. I'm going to make you confess to the murder of those innocent visitors at the prison. I don't know what you're talking about. You cannot lie to me. I know. You killed those men in cold blood. That's a lie. I'll admit you're clever. You did your job with fiendish genius. But you're at the end of your rope, Kesey. The only hope left for you is to confess and clear your soul. Oh, no, I'll admit nothing. Leave me alone. I won't confess. Oh, yes, you will. I'm not through with you yet. Look, Kesey. In this corner of the room... Right here. That's it. Now watch carefully, and you'll see someone you met not many hours ago. Look, Keezy. Look. Cranston. There. Now you see standing before you the man you strapped in the chair a few hours ago. Go away. Go away. You're dead. You're dead. Confess, Keezy. I killed you. You're dead. Confess. I won't. I won't. Go away. Confess. Wait. Wait. Confess. All right. All right. I did it. I killed him. But I'll never be taken alive. Never. Never. Ah! But in the story, Ghosts Can Kill, technical problems arose, and Cranston, after fluffing a line, was forced to begin his shadow routine filterless. Stop the car. Let me out. I'll let you out, all right, in ten feet of water when we get to the river. No, no. Let me out. You didn't let me out of the chair, did you, Governor? I burned, remember? Well, you'll drown. Stop the car! Stop it, I say, you'll kill us both! can't kill a dead man, can you, Governor? Ah, the old fool went and croaked by himself. Scared to death. Ah, it saves me the trouble. (laughs) I wouldn't be too sure of that, Gorman. Hey, what? What's that? Governor Roberts is unharmed. He's only fainted. He has a weak heart. Who's that? Where are you? You didn't know you had the shadow as a passenger. Oh, the shadow, huh? Well, you can't hurt me. Even a shadow can't harm a ghost. But you're not a ghost, Gorman. Yeah, that's what you think. Don't you know that Ralph Gorman is dead? Certainly. But you're not Ralph Gorman. You're his twin brother, Arthur. That's a lie. No, it isn't, Arthur. I went down to the city records office and checked up on the birth certificate. A very pretty little story. Your mother had twin boys and concealed the fact from everyone. He brought you two up deliberately for a life of crime. Very convenient, wasn't it, Arthur? No matter what crime one of you committed, the other was always seen somewhere else at the same time to furnish a complete alibi. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Arthur Gorman. Enlisting the titles of the hundreds of shadow scripts broadcast over the years, four words abound conspicuously. Murder, death, kill, and ghost. Without trying to oversimplify, it must be admitted that most shadow scripts were variations on or combinations of four basic plots. The mad scientist's quest for power, the quest for revenge, the old dark house mystery, and the vulnerability plot in which Cranston's powers as the shadow are either challenged or threatened with public exposure. A few moments ago we heard an excerpt from Guest of Death, if you don't recall how the villain met his end, we'll refresh your memory. All right, I did it, I killed him. But I'll never be taken alive, never, never! Ah! This type of ending was not unusual in shadow melodramas. Here is a cut from Spider Boy, a creepy tale about a reclusive young man who fancies himself a spider with the ability to spin a web. Oh... I didn't mean to intrude. Come in. Oh, uh... The room looks familiar, doesn't it? Why, yes. Come in and see. I have been here before. The day you brushed down all my spider webs. Yes, the spider webs. The day you killed the spider, my only friend. How did you know? I know more than you think. 
Don't close that door. You came here when you were not wanted that day. Now you'll find out some things you won't want to know. You're mad. Look, see the new webs in the corners? See? Those webs I have spun since you killed my spider. You are insane. Completely insane. When my spider friend died, she left her secret with me. Let me go. Watch me closely. Watch. See the steel like red as I spin it? Let me go. See? When it's been a web to hold you. Will you tight? Stop. You die if you kill my spider. No, no. Spin it around you up and down and around and around. No. Right here and I hate you. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to have a revenge. <laughs> Who opened the door? Who's there? The shadow, spider boy. I, I don't see anyone. Where are you? You'll never find me, spider boy. You can't spin your web around thin air. Help. Please help. Miss Lane. There. There you are. Oh. Oh. You've torn my web from the girl. The web has fallen to the floor. You see, Spider Boy, you have no magic. I have. The spider left me her secret. I can spin. You cannot spin. You're caught, Spider Boy, caught in your own web of insanity. No, no. You'll never get me. <laughs> I'll escape. I can leave like my spider, let myself down out of the window. I can spin strong steel fibers and let myself down. Don't go that window. I'll show the whole world the secret the spider left me. Stop! Ah! Or how about Carnival of Death? By the time of its broadcast, we can only assume that the Mutual Network Sound Effects Department had run out of windows for the villains to jump through. Right this way, young lady. I shall entertain you in my private subway car. No, no, I won't go in there. Let go of me. Now, now, you mustn't behave that way. The other passengers won't like you. Oh, Lamont. Lamont! He won't hear you, my dear. By this time, he's been swallowed up by the quicksand. Just as your friend that detective was earlier this evening. No, no, that isn't true. Nothing has happened to him. Tell me that nothing's happened to Lamont. Oh, he'll be in good company. There are many others in there, too, you know. Now, step into the car. No, I won't. No, take your hands off of me. Oh, you don't enjoy Pop Wright's hospitality, do you? Now, then I shall have to force you in. Don't it. Stop it. There we are. Now, you must meet your fellow passengers. Oh. Oh, how horrible. But it, it's dead. Oh, some of them are, yes. Yeah. The rest are merely wax figures from the museum. Oh, there's the missing boy and girl. They're dead, too. They're my newest passengers. They seem to like it here, too, sitting side by side. Oh, it's terrible. I must make room for you, my dear. I think that I shall give you seat six. That old woman that's sitting there now, I'm a little tired of her. I'm afraid she must join your friend in the quicksand. Oh, no. No, you're mad. You're mad. Oh, I wish... I wish you wouldn't say those things in front of my friends. You see, Lewis, this wax figure here, he, he doesn't like it at all. Do you, Lewis? Dear me, your tie is crooked again, Lewis. I have to fix it. Oh, I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, no, please. No, let go. No, you're... Can't you're she staying here for a long time. Oh, a yes. very long time. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? That knife. Put down that knife. No, no. It'll all be over in a short time. Just stand no. there. No. Just stand no. there. No, keep away. No, soon you will. No. <laughs> Put down that knife, Pop Right. Oh, the shadow. Huh? What was that? Don't touch that girl. Oh, one of the spirits. One of the spirits has returned to speak to me. Yes. Yes, that's true. I am one of the spirits. The spirit of the man you just killed in the shooting gallery. Oh, it's you, Fred. I, I'm i sorry I had to do that to you, but you would learn too much about me and this rendezvous. Why have you killed these people? Why have you brought them to this deserted tunnel? I belong down here. You know that, Fred. I've been the motorman on this line since the first run. You remember that run, don't you? Yes, yes. Yes, you know, too, that my wife and child were killed on that first ride. Killed on a train that I was driving. Of course. John Norcross put me on a pension. He thought that would make up for the loss of my wife and child. 
He made me a watchman. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, thought he'd pay me off that way. But I fooled him. I fooled him. Why have you killed these people? I needed passengers. You can't run a train without passengers, can you? That's my job here, you know. John Norcross doesn't know it. But his subway line still operates. Yes. How did you get these people here? Oh, different ways, different ways. Some of them from the boat ride, some from the wax museum. They all take the nightly ride with me in the Midnight Express. Those rides are all finished now, Pop Wright. No. No, that isn't true. I'll tell the police about them. They'll come and get you. Oh, no, you wouldn't do that. No. No, no, who would run the line? You, you, You don't mean that, I'm sure. I'm taking you to the police right now. Oh, no. Oh, no. He's no. running out of the car. Come back. No. Come back here. Come and get me. Look, he's opening a door in the wall. That's where the quicksand is. He's jumping into it. No! The premise of some shadow scripts often lay somewhere between fascinating and ridiculous. For example, this cut from Death is an Art. All right, Margo. Come in. That was fast work, Lamont. Yeah. Watchman's in that little office back there, scared speechless. Then he won't disturb us. Not a chance. Come on. We'll have to work fast. They're going to take Pencil John out tonight. Did you find out why? No. But my guess is that Harper's afraid to have it around since it was recognized today. Well, what'll they do with him, Lamont? Destroy him, I suppose. Oh, how horrible. Horrible's hardly the word. <laughs> you cold, Muggle? No, just nervous, I guess. An art gallery is certainly a spooky place at night. Uh, here we are, Muggle. The month is pencil, John. Yes. Be interesting to see if Harper even worked out the fingerprints, too, eh, Margo? That certainly would clinch your theory. Well, let's see if he... Uh, here you are, Margo. Look, the fingerprints are perfect. Have you got that sense? Pencil John's fingerprints? Yes, right here, Lamont. Good. Now we'll make a little comparison. Yeah. Take a look, Margo. The fingerprints match up perfectly. Perfectly? There's no question about it. This is Pencil John. And all these other statues, they're real people, too. Exactly. But how could they do this, Lamont? That I don't know yet, Margo. But I hope to soon. Lamont, do you notice one feature that's characteristic of all these statues? I noticed it when I first saw them. Yes. The look of horror on their faces. Is that what you mean? Yes. Ghastly. Listen, Margo. Somebody's coming. In the 40s, the physical dimensions of rooms must have been quite large. For as the killer approaches her, Margo Lane's retreating footsteps in Death is a Nursery Rhyme and The Terrible Legend of Crown Shield Castle seem almost endless, as we'll hear in a moment. Earlier, we heard examples of one typical shadow ending, with a villain shouting, You'll never take me alive! and then jumping from a window, or into quicksand. These next two cuts also illustrate another popular type of conclusion in which the shadow gives the villain of the week a mini-lecture on morality. Another note. Yes. And the odd part about it is, it's addressed to you. To me? Yes. Read it. See, saw, Marjorie Daw. Jackie shall have a new master. He shall have but a penny a day. Because he can't work any faster. I, I don't understand. Marjorie Daw. It's almost like Margot. You mean the killer? I mean, I'm afraid he means you, Miss Lane. Margot. Marjorie. Very close, aren't they? Close enough for all practical purposes. Dr. Fucker, why are you... Look at me like that. It's a nice rhyme, isn't it? It has a swing to it. I, I... See, so. Marjorie Daw. Jackie shall have a new master. He shall have but a penny a day because he can't work any faster. You're the nursery rhyme killer. Yes, Miss Lane, I am. I love nursery rhymes. <laughs> oh, what a hubbard. Went to a cupboard. To get a poor dog, a bone. Stay away from me. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner eating his Christmas pie. Stay away. Jack and Jill went up the hill. Hey. Peter, Peter, put Kitty down. Oh. These poor Marjorie. Oh. <laughs> Who's in this room? I don't see anyone. I... <laughs> Someone, I... Someone I can't see. 
Who are you? Would you like to hear a little nursery rhyme, Dr. Foster? Who are you? I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me. What can be the use of him is more than I can see. Stop! Very, very like me from the heels up to the head. And I see him jump before me when I jump into my bed. Stop it! Stop it! I'm going mad! Don't mad already, Foster. Your mind has been clouded by the dark shadows you profess to study. Who are you? Who are you? The shadow, Foster. The shadow here to see justice done. <laughs> shadow? You thought you could blame these murders on Bert and then on his father. You became so obsessed with his case that your own mind broke under the strain. Uh, let me out of here. I've got to get out of here. No, Foster. The state has a place for you. A place where never again will you be allowed loose among society. A place where you can safely recite nursery rhymes to your heart's content. <laughs> Face down here, all right. One heavy door, stone walls. Kind of frightening, though. Just this one candle on an old wine cask. Who's that? What? I wonder if that's Lamont back so soon. Let me in, please let me in. What? Sounds like Sheila. She must be in trouble, maybe. Just a minute, Sheila, I'm coming. Miss Lane, thank you for opening the door. I came down here to be safe. I guess that's the same reason you're here. Yes, it is. It isn't very cheery down here with only this one candle. Just so long as no one can get at us. That's the main thing. Yes, of course. This must have been a terrible ordeal for you, Sheila. Yes, it's been pretty much of a strain. First Bridget and then Henry and then... Oh, you... You do know about your brother, of course. Yes, I know about Brad. Terrible, wasn't it? Awful. What a shame for you. This is just father and I left. And you too, of course. Mr. Cranston will see that your father's taken care of, Sheila. He'll arrange to have him sent away. Will he? Of course. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. How do you mean, glad? That's what I've been working for. That's why I persuaded you to spend the night here so that you would see father as he really, really is. And then you would help me put him away. I see. That's why I've been taking care of Father so carefully lately. Giving him his medicine regularly. Sheila, please, you're getting yourself upset. Upset? <laughs> You'd be surprised at how upset I can really get, Miss Lane. Sheila! I can get so upset sometimes that I think I have to get rid of everyone who discovers my secret. Sheila, stay away from me. And I will, too, if I have to. I'll kill all of you. And they'll say my father did it. They'll scream murder at him when he stands behind the bars of the asylum. Sheila, please. But I'll be safe. Nobody will know about me because none of you will talk. Get away! It's no use trying to get behind that wine cask, Miss Lane. I'm strong. Very strong. No, Miss Lane. No! My wrist. Who's holding my wrist? Let go of that girl's throat. Oh. That's better, Sheila. Shadow. <laughs> You're back. Yes, Sheila. Back to accuse you of being the terrible legend of Crown Shield Castle. No, it's my father. He's the one. No, it's you who inherited the powerful madness. When you found the insanity coming over you, you tried to shift the blame to your father. Physically, but not mentally, the exact image of old Joseph Crown Shield. No, that's a lie. It's the truth, Sheila. <laughs> The shadow has seen your father. I know you gave him drugs disguised as medicine, kept him locked in the stable when you wanted him out of the way. All right, Shadow, I did kill them all. But you'll never hold me for those murders. I'm going out this door. It's locked. The shadow Please. has the key. I'll tear it off its hinges. Not that door, Sheila. Then I'll beat the walls. Then I'll beat them with my bare fist. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. No, Sheila. <laughs> You're not going out ever again. Now on, you'll stay inside for the rest of your life. Even more sermonic was the end of The Ghost of Captain Balo. Perhaps the writers had to justify the series' famous opening credo. These dramas are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. <laughs>
make her out yet, Mr. Yandy? Yes. Yes, she's a yacht. A rich man's plaything. It'll soon be his coffin. They got the engines going again, sir. Very well. Turn on the black beam. Short the motors. Yes, sir. That's got him. She's helpless on a tie. Now, turn on the magno beam. Magnetize the rudder. Right. Got it. Hold her on it. Steer the rudder toward the rocks on the north end of the island. Yes, sir. There. <laughs> That's one more crew that will never be able to tell of the mineral wealth of this island. Your secret is still safe. I've guarded it for 18 years. Since the day I discovered it, no one will ever share the wealth or know it exists. And another wreck will be chalked up to the ghost of Captain Baylow. Yes. Captain Baylow has been a most convenient ghost. <laughs> a most plausible one. Nobody ever doubts him, it seems. <laughs> what was that? I thought I heard a laugh. I heard it. Have you the radio key open? No, sir. I cut it before. <laughs> You're lying to me, you... No, no, I swear I'm not, Mr. Yandy. You... No, oh, no, no, Mr. Yandy. This is not a voice you can cut off with a flick of a dial. What? Who are you? I am the Shadow. The Shadow? I've heard of him. He's the guy you can't see. Your use of the Captain Balo legend is at an end, Yandy. You've created havoc with your diabolically clever electrical inventions. Like a monster... You've destroyed men because of your insatiable greed. Well, Yandy, this is your finish. Yeah. The sea will be well rid of you, and poor Captain Baylor will rest peacefully in his sea grave. What's that? The slaves. They've escaped from their dungeon. Yes, Yandy, they're crawling out of the earth to vent their just hatred on you. Turn on the heat ray. Burn them up. Burn them to a crisp. Right. Tubes. They're all broken. My equipment is ruined. Completely, Mr. Yandy. My yacht is free of your clever magno beam. And those people down there will soon be done with you. I'm getting out. Out of my way. If you're not getting on that boat, you got hit on the cold without us. I don't care what happens to you. Take care of yourself. <laughs> run, run, Yandy. The sooner to meet your doom. Lamont, are you here? Oh, Lamont. Yes, Margot. I'm quite all right. Oh, thank heaven. Look, Margot. The captives have taken their captor. They've got Yandy. They'll tear him to pieces. Mm, that would be little less than the thing well deserves. But I suppose we'll have to try and save him for the law. Come along, Margot. No time to lose. Well, we've got all those men you saved from the dungeons berthed below deck, Mr. Cranston. The poor devils don't know how to thank you. Take good care of them, Captain. Aye, aye, ma'am. Have you found out yet what happened to Yandy and his men, Lamont? Yes, Margot. One of the men just told me. But he waited until we were well out to sea first. What did they do with them? Well, they didn't pitch them into the sea, as they told us. They locked them in their own dungeons. And it's too late for us to do anything about that now. So we'll have to leave Yandy and his confederates to suffer. As long as their lives last. The terrible fate they designed for others. We can almost wish for a villain who, when caught, says something like, Please, Cranston, no lectures. Shadow expert, Anthony Tolan. Cranston had a strange group of friends. Margot should have headed for the hills whenever Lamont said he was going to introduce her to one of his old college friends. Because it always turned out to be a maniac. Here's my old college professor. Uh, he can't walk, but his servant carries him around the room. Here's a fellow student of mine who had a horrible voice in college. Nowadays, he transplants vocal cords from uh, mastiffs into little kittens. The shadow so often featured these old dark house type stories. Our car has broken down, Lamont, but we're in luck. There's a light on in that house up on the hill. Now, the shadow stories were noted as frequently having these totally unrealistic, uh, horrifying plots. And you listen to the Orson Welles show. There is a month period in 1938 where there are three shows with unbelievable plots. One of them revolves around a religious cult that is taking in the teenagers of the town. Uh, these teenagers are joining this religious cult, and the townspeople are afraid 
of this cult leader. Another show that same month features a senator on trial because he's taken a $50,000 bribe and it's been filmed. Unbelievable in 1938. Another plot involves a deranged war veteran who has been taught to kill and gets up on building rooftops and starts firing at people on the street. I mean, now that could never happen in a, in a thousand years. I mean, who's ever, who ever heard of such things happening in the real world? Well, maybe not in 1938, but you wait long enough and it's become our world. But those were all plots in a one-month period of Orson Welles on the Shadow. You had then, as I said, the haunted house stories. You had the vengeance stories where you would have uh, someone coming back supposedly after death to get the jurors and the judge and the district attorney who sent him to the death house. The shadow was melodrama. I mean, no one is ever going to call the shadow great drama, but it was great melodrama. You knew that when the car broke down on that lonely country road or when you went for a reunion with your old college classmates, or when Margo went to visit her aunt on the bayou in Louisiana. Something was going to happen. The early shows in the Orson Welles and the early Bill Johnstone era experimented a great deal with the shadow's powers, particularly telepathy. In The Three Ghosts, the shadow puts mental pictures into someone's mind. The shadow continually can read minds at that period. He doesn't rely completely on invisibility. Uh, later the show becomes quite formularized. Gee, it's 15 minutes into the show. It's time for Margot to be captured by the deranged madmen we're looking for this week. The early shows experiment with the shadow's power, finding new uses of the shadow's powers. The later shows frequently work with the limitations of the shadow's powers. Yes, the shadow can cloud someone's mind so they cannot see him. But does that mean his footprints won't show up in plush carpeting? Uh, yes, you can't see the shadow, but your electric eye on your door can see the shadow. Uh, similarly, if you're filming, if you've got it in camera, the shadow can cloud your minds, but he can't cloud the camera's lens. Uh, all of these things were experimented or were dealt with in later years of the shadow. One aspect of radio production, often either overlooked or taken for granted, is the music that serves to set the mood of the story and bridges or connects one dramatic scene to another. One of radio's most famous musicians is Rosa Rio, today staff organist for the Video Yesteryear Company's reissues of vintage silent films. We recently caught up with Miss Rio between Charlie Chaplin two reelers in the Video Yesteryear studios. My first job in radio was The Shadow. We had an audience at that time. And that was something in that day and time because would, they generally didn't want to ever have an audience for a radio show because actors uh, didn't always uh, uh, resemble the uh, character they were. In other words, you might find a young man, 19 or 29, and he's taking the part of an 80 year or 90 year old man. So rather than have audience in, we, we said no, so everyone would have their own picture in their minds. However, in the shadow, uh, they, they, the actors and all were in very subdued lights. And there were two microphones for the shadow in the time that he was the shadow and then when he was Ma Cranston. So he would run over to the filtered mic, you see, and sometimes he wore a, a big hat and sometimes a dark uh, over his eyes. So it kind of gave an illusion, but you didn't see it clearly. It wasn't like we had spotlights on us. Generally, the cast always had a uh, rehearsal beforehand, but on Sunday, we had the dress rehearsal, one just on one rehearsal, and that. And that was quite usual for, for organists to save the money. <laughs> they didn't pay for our rehearsals, where the cast would have extra rehearsals, you see. But they relied on an organist knowing his or her stuff and come in at the last minute and do it and save the rehearsal money. So but generally, we had a dress rehearsal, and that was it. And fortunately, they always placed the uh, sound man near the organist. And we had, uh, we sort of worked in cooperation, you see, with each other, and we decided who, was, who would do this and who would do that, and, and that was a lot of fun. And I would say the sound man was very, very important on the show. 
He was very important. And the music is important. We were really um, a little surprised at recently two interviews on uh, the uh, shadow, and not once was the music or the organ ever mentioned. And you know, today with all the little young people, all I have to do is to play the theme, and they know it's the shadow. Instantly, you see? And it, it, it identified with it. So the minute this starts, you see, the people say the shadows. Little kids know that today. And yet, not a thing is mentioned in, in the interviews of music and how important it was to, to, to uh, set the scene and the mood. Emotionally, it's, it's very important. I composed the bridges, and uh, as a rule, you had 10 seconds or maybe 8 seconds, and told that you must express the scene within that given time. Yet to get on the air, you might get the finger going round and round and round and telling you to move it, move it fast. Or you might have gotten the stretch, pulling the hands apart, telling you. So the thing that you wrote out for 10 seconds turns out to be 15. Or the thing you wrote for 10 seconds turned out to be 4 or 6 seconds. Meaning that I would have a little idea of what I wanted, but I had to be sure to improvise, to know how <laughs> that you just couldn't say I ran out of music or I don't have any more music. So you do have to improvise. Rosa Rio recalls Brett Morrison. Brett was a very, very unusual guy. He was wonderful. We had a, we had a great friendship, uh, Brett and I. We, we both loved horses. And we used to go, uh, uh, when we could, uh, we'd go up to, to Garrison, New York, and there was a big ranch there, and we would ride horses. And uh, he had a lovely apartment on uh, Central Park West, and he entertained beautifully, and uh, he was wonderful to work with. We had a lovely time together and a, and a lot of fun. I, I miss him. He is gone now. But he was, he was a lot of fun. I never thought once that, that uh, what would happen to the shadow, that all these years would pass, and it's probably bigger than ever. I don't think uh, that I was aware at any time in my life in radio that uh, things would have uh, turned out the way they did. Never once. I think we all, I would say in radio, probably was, uh, we found the most dedicated actors and actresses and other people associated, to, of course, with it. Uh, the, everyone was so dedicated, and none of us uh, really, I don't think any one of us thought far ahead there would be such a thing as uh, TV and all these things ahead. But we thought we were riding pretty good. In fact, I was laughing and said, well, I, at last I found my niche for life. And, I, and when television came in, uh, that, that blew the bubbles. No, we all were very dedicated, and we did our job uh, because we really loved it. And the thing that was very wonderful about radio was, uh, whether it's The Shadow or any of the many programs I played, we all worked together and felt like one big family. Since we talked about The Shadow, get nervous, here you go. Little Marco Lane in distress? Okay. fun with those things, and we still do. We still do indeed, for although The Shadow ended its long run on the Mutual Network in December 1954, Charles Michelson has been syndicating recordings of the original broadcasts to radio stations since 1963. There was a large in-car automobile audience who had com been completely forgotten, and once we put on our radio dramas, and people were driving along the interstate highways or wherever and turning the dial when they would come to a story they would stop and they would listen and it wasn't very long after that when we found that the rating services they picked it up and uh, 
that, as much as anything else I can think of, helped our placement of the radio dramas. We were able to establish not a pretty good, but a very good record of audience acceptance and ratings, which is what the stations and everybody goes by. So that today we are running in cities like Los Angeles, in Cleveland, in Philadelphia, in San Francisco, and in, in San Diego, in Syracuse, in the major markets around the country, and we're very selective. And so the shadow endures, perhaps somewhat diminished in popularity from that of its heyday, but nonetheless it remains an indelible.